Good evening, Sigma Chi brothers and all others who are joining us for this November edition of SIG Talks. I'm Jim Cooper, a SIG graduate of the Alpha Chi chapter at Penn State and currently vice president of the New York City area alumni chapter and chairperson for SIG Talks. We have a terrific topic tonight, the United States National Parks, and that includes two outstanding Sigma Chi speakers on that very topic. John Jarvis had a distinguished 41 year career in the National Park Service, culminating in his appointment as 18th director of the United States National Park Service from 2009 through 2017. John is a 1975 graduate of William and Mary College, where he earned a bachelor degree in biology and was initiated as a Sigma Chi. John also proudly served as McGeester during his undergraduate days. Joining John this evening is Will Shaproth. Will is currently president and chief executive officer of the National Park Foundation. He became a Sigma Chi at University of California, Santa Barbara, where in 1980, he earned a bachelor degree in political science and environmental studies Will went on to receive a Master's of Public Administration from the Harvard Kennedy School in 1991. John and Will are to be interviewed this evening by SIGS Bruce Kastner, a graduate of the George Washington University and tonight's representative of the District of Columbia Alumni Chapter. Bruce has served as a Grand Trustee for 25 years where he was Chairman of the Board for two terms. He is also President Emeritus of the Washington, D.C. Alumni Chapter. Bruce's co-interview is Grand Trustee, Bruce's co-interviewer is Grand Trustee and Order of Constantine SIG, Jeff Murison. Jeff is a graduate of Dickinson College and currently serves as President of the Raleigh, North Carolina Alumni Chapter. It should be noted that we have tapped Jeff to be an interviewer for this SIG talk, as he has been to 32 of the 65 national parks, and he is determined to visit all the rest of them during the remainder of his lifetime. Following the interview with John and Will, there will be time for questions from you, the SIG talk audience. You may drop your questions in the chat, and we strongly encourage you to do so. So let's get this show on the road, Bruce, Please get our SIG talk started. Thank you, Jim. Welcome, brothers. Glad to have you with us tonight. I'm happy to report that both of you have been speakers at the Washington Live Chapter luncheons in the past. John, please share with us the mission of the National Park Service. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Bruce and Jim. Uh, Will, it's good to see you and all the brothers out there. So the mission of the National Park Service is to preserve the natural and cultural resources as well as the values of all the national parks unimpaired for the benefit of both current and future generations. So every National Park Service employee can say that and it's, uh, it's uh, deeply embedded in the, the core values of the agency. Thanks. Uh Will, tell us about the, how the, the, what role the foundation plays. Sure, thank you. Thanks for having us on. Um, the National Park Foundation is, is the official charity for the National Park Service. So, so we are chartered by Congress to, to raise private resources and support the national parks and the programs and projects that they need funding for uh, so they can do more, they can do it faster, and they can do it more creatively. The... Uh, my notes show that the Congress created the National Park Foundation Act to support the national parks in 1967. Mm -hmm. Will, tell us uh, how, how have you grown over the years, and particularly since you took over as chair? Um, it's a good question. Back in 1967, uh, there really were no organizations like ours that were supporting a government agency, and it was under the Johnson administration. Lady Bird Johnson, Stuart Udall, and then Secretary of the Interior and Lawrence Rockefeller had this idea of creating a, a nonprofit entity uh, to give people an outlet to to support the parks financially and, and, and through volunteerism, things like that, uh, much like they supported their schools or their churches or their universities or 
or other places in their communities. And people would leave national parks just having had an amazing experience. We all feel the awe and wonder as human beings of these amazing places. And so the foundation was really there to recognize that 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 people want to want to want to do something to give back to them. And uh, just like it is today, even back in 1957, uh, funding the national parks is a team sport. It's not just something that government's ever going to be able to do on its own uh, to, so that they can achieve their full potential. So the foundation started in 67. Um, I like to say that it took us uh, 45 years to raise the first $500 million. And around the time that, that John and I were involved, uh, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, it took us five, five years to raise the second $500 million. And I give John a huge amount of credit for that, having been the director at the time, seeing the the, pot, the potential of the foundation to really do so much more uh, for our national parks. And uh, since then, we've been on a trajectory. This last year, we raised $183 million in support of the parks. So we continue to, to do more uh, to, 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 to protect the parks and to give the visitors an even better experience. John, there are 63 national parks, but the national park system has 425 units that include national monuments, national historical parks, national recreation areas, and so on. Can you briefly explain to us, Layman, the difference in all these designations? How many hours do we have on this program? Um, so um, the, the thing to remember is that all of these units, which is not a very good title, um, are managed by the National Park Service under the same set of laws and policies as the national parks, the ones that have that moniker, that, that title. So the national monuments, national recreation areas, um, national historical parks, all of those gained those names basically through the designation process, some of them by the president, some of them by Congress. Um, and those names can change. They have changed in the past. Uh, Pinnacles National Monument here in California was converted by Congress to a national park status. Nothing really changed other than the name, uh, but they're all managed with the same core mission and same set of values. Very good, thank you. Jeff. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Although most people think of the parks as places like Yellowstone and Yosemite, these iconic landscapes and wildlife, uh, the parks also focus on telling America's story. Can you share your perspective on the importance of that part of the, the system's mission? Sure. The, um, it was a really interesting kind of historical point that uh, uh, FDR, as president, was coming back from Shenandoah National Park, where he had a, a little bit of a hideout. The, escape DC and he was riding back with the second director of the Park Service, Horace Albright. And at the time, all of the battlefields of the United States, Civil War, Revolutionary War, the war memorials were all managed by the War Department, by the Department of Defense. And Albright convinced FDR to transfer them to the National Park Service. And, uh, and so in a single move by then President Roosevelt, the Park Service took on the responsibility to be the steward of American history. And so since that time, we've been adding presidential uh, homes, uh, civil rights sites, um, sites where the nation did not live up to its, its values, like the, the confinement, imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II at Manzanar and Minidoka and the like. And I, I, I think it gives, the Park Service, the responsibility to help America remember, remember who we are, remember what our responsibilities are under the Constitution, to remember our history, both the good and the dark periods of American history. And so uh, we are, uh, we tell story through place. <clears throat> we have the, the sites, let's say, I like to say where the fires of democracy perhaps burned the hottest and the brightest. And we have rangers on site and the physical resources to be able to tell those stories and inspire and inform a new generation. Jeff, it's okay. Let me jump in here too. I think uh, that John gave a great summary of that I spent today on the National Mall here in Washington, D.C. at the FDR Memorial and a few other places. And 
I mean, that's a place that the Park Service manages that contains a whole lot of places. 35 million people visited the National Mall in 2022, and and um, 8 million of whom went to the Lincoln Memorial, and uh, you know, there are another four or five went to the Jefferson Memorial. These are places that that really, in one in one area in D.C., cover a lot of the history and really important people in it. Uh, but also, one of my favorite sites in the system is you know pretty lesser known, and it's Little Rock Central High School that talks about the Little Rock Nine, who in, in 1957 uh, really were, were you know the Little Rock Central High School was forcibly integrated with the National Guard and. Uh, See the bravery on the faces of those nine young African American kids at that time was ext- extremely moving and really, you know, helped uh, our nation's arc of justice, if you will. Uh, and the Park Service is there to tell that story uh, in in its totality. Thank you. Uh, recently, I visited uh, some of the newer parks: Indiana Dunes and New River Gorge. Mm-hmm. Briefly, what's the process for creating a new national park? So the, the process is generally that Congress authorizes a study. Um, and then the Park Service um, conducts that study. They conduct public meetings. They do an evaluation of the resources that are there. And there are three criteria that the Park Service uses. There are significance, suitability, and feasibility. And those are three sort of bars you have to get over in order for it to be go forward as a, as a national park designation, a new unit of the system. Um, and the, the two ways, the two legal paths that a new unit can be established is either by the president, the sitting president has unique authority under something called the Antiquities Act of 1906. They can designate a national monument. And then Congress has broad authority to create any type of unit of the national park system, including national parks. But those are the result of generally a recommendation by the National Park Service of whether or not this site meets these three criteria. National significance, suitability would mean, does the Park Service sort of already got one like that? And this is just a repeat of the same thing. And then feasibility is like, you know, who owns it? What is its condition? could it actually become a federal site? I think I would add to that, Jeff, is that the, that um, in the National Monument designation stat, uh, process, uh, there are a whole lot of public process. John kind of acknowledged, but but John and I were a part of something through the creation of something called the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument back in 2016, which was somewhat unusual. Many of the national monuments are actually uh, created through the just the transfer of land from the Department of Defense or some other federal agency to the Park Service, so the Park Service can can manage and interpret the history and manage the natural resources and cultural resources in a in the way that it's really known to be the best at. But in this case, it was um is up in Maine, and uh, John John uh, was there present for a a large public hearing in Orono, Maine, and uh, I don't know how many hundreds of people showed up. Uh, most of them were were upset. Uh, they they they've been led to believe this is going to be a terrible thing, and and so John was the lead government official in the room, and and had to listen to somewhere between six and eight hours of testimony. Uh, at the end of which, he responded to every single person that had made a comment, and that's part of the duty of someone like John and his position as director of the National Park Service to really listen to and respond to. The public and their address their concerns and you know be open to their questions, uh, and it really it, it enriched the, the the process, enriched people's knowledge of this place, and ultimately the president designated it on the hundredth anniversary of the national parks in August of twenty sixteen, and um, I can tell you that 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 park is off to a great start uh, with huge support from local community. Yeah, and we could have never done that without the support of the National Park Foundation as sort of a facilitator of that donation uh, from uh, Roxanne Quinby, the founder of Burt's Bees, uh, who really uh, worked to uh, to acquire uh, a, a quite a large section of land uh, through Phil Willing Seller and then donate it to the National Park Service. But the NPF was the facilitator for that, that as well. And 
back to the public meeting thing. I may be a masochist, but I like public meetings. Uh, I really enjoy listening to the public. I really um, uh, enjoy sitting up there and, and hearing from the, all the different ideas and concerns uh, and have done it hundreds of times. It's a, it's a fascinating and really important responsibility of, of the National Park Service is to hear from the public. I'm, I'm convinced actually that John learned that skill as McGeester in his chapter of William and Mary because I'm sure that the brothers there were, were causing him to, to, to develop skill sets to, to manage chaos. Yeah, but I didn't listen to a single word the pledges said. <laughs> Bruce? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Will and, and, uh, and John, this next question is for both of you. What would each of you point to as your most significant contribution to the success, success of National Park Service? Uh, Will, why don't you lead off on that? Wow, that's a that's a big one. Um, I, have, I only just I only get one of those. Uh, I want to say that in in 2016, uh, John and I were confronted with a situation in Grand Teton National Park where uh, the uh, the state of Wyoming expressed a willingness to sell a 640 acre piece of land that it owned within the boundaries of Grand Teton. And uh, we had six months to come up with $46 million, uh, half of which would be paid for by the government and half of which would be paid for pri private contributions that our partners at the Grand Teton National Park Foundation had to raise. This was a, an unprecedented amount of money and, and also in a very short period of time. And, uh, uh, as I, as we were successful in that, we had, we closed the deal on about December 12, 2016. And the reason that was significant is that there's something so tangible about this piece of land that is among the most important wildlife corridors in North America. And to imagine it being subdivided into 20, uh, 35 acre parcels would have been horrendous. And, and, uh, in one of the most beautiful places in the national park system, we we're able to set that aside permanently and it'll always be there for future generations to appreciate. Thank you, Will. Yeah. John, what was your, in your mind, what was your most significant well, contribution? To other that? than actually not getting into the fist fight associated with that particular issue in the bar in Grand Teton here in Jackson um, I had your back, John. Don't worry about thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, there's a there's a bunch I could talk about, but there's one that I'm particularly proud of, and that is that when I um, took on as the director of the National Park Service, the National Park Service was the most dangerous agency in federal government for the employees' health and safety, other than the Department of Defense. We injured or killed more employees on an annual basis than any other federal agency including Border Patrol and others. And it was a, we really looked into it deeply. We had tried for many years to solve this problem because there was inherently a culture of self-sacrifice in the Park Service that in the worst possible conditions, when someone is out there uh, in trouble, you know, and I was a ranger myself, we go and we go and we don't always come back. And that was part of the culture. And so we had to really face up to that. And we adopted a, a program that had been developed in the Coast Guard because they had a very similar culture of you got to go out, but you don't have to come back. And they did some deep dive and they developed something called operational leadership. And it was a, a fairly simple um, system by which you evaluate the risk that you're about to take on. And any member of the team, regardless of where they sit in the hierarchy, could raise their hand and say, wait a minute, we're about ready to do something that may, one of us may be injured or lose their life. And you stop and you do an evaluation and you bring it back under control. We trained 20,000 employees in this program. Um, we trained the entire workforce in operational leadership and it resulted in a reduction and the injuries and deaths by 75% uh, across the entire system. So, and that is still here today. So I'm pretty proud of that. John, that's uh, absolutely estimable. Well done on that. Jeff? I'm gonna actually um, 
pull an audible and follow up on that. Uh, one of our future questions was is um, with the um, with the increase in park attendance, the, the advent of selfies, and the popularity of adventure tourism. How is the park system responding to the dangers and safety issues that uh, the rangers, the the visitors, are all encountering or making ma making on their own? You take that one, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say this now that I'm not director, but there's no regulation against being stupid. Right. Um, that 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 people go out and think they're in a zoo. They think that they're these these animals are not wild. Um, that there are going to be handrails and guardrails at every overlook. Um, that there are no snakes and there's no whatever, no alligators in that uh, in that swamp. And um, and they get a reality check when they go to the national park. So we we do our very very best to warn the public, to educate them, but it's not our job to fence off. The park from all of the 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 potentiality of people being injured, um, and um, so it, there there are inherent risks uh, when you go to some of the national parks, and that's part of the experience. I mean, in my view, that's to go and sleep, as Jeff you mentioned earlier, in bear country, uh, is is something that you remember, you know. It's not often you think of yourself as prey, uh, but it's it's something that is unforgettable. So I think that um, we try our best to let the public know. And um, what's kind of interesting today, the public is sort of policing itself uh, with a lot of the social media uh, photography and comments on Instagram and others about people doing stupid stuff uh, in the parks. I'd also say that John, I think you agree with me on this, that, that um, you know, COVID tamped down in international visitation by quite a bit, but that's coming back. And I think that, you know, one of the challenges the Park Service has is to make sure that it's able to communicate with the diversity of visitors from other parts of the world uh, who don't speak English necessarily. And, and uh, so in some of the bigger parks, they have uh, rangers who speak Mandarin and many speak Spanish and, and to ensure that there's signage so that people who visit a place like that for the first time have an ability to, to to be as safe as they can be. So that's an added burden, I think, in a way, John, because that's not historically been something the Park Service has been able to do, but but important nonetheless. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I've come face to face with some bears in multiple parks, and it's a memorable experience. So you're right on there, John. Um, during the pandemic and since the the parks have become really popular, the you know the need to get outside and and uh, you know enjoy mother nature and get away from the pandemic how has the system responded to the challenges of just the population growth and in, in visitation especially at the at the really popular parks yeah i'll take it first will then you can jump in so in the really popular parks um the park service has implemented a number of things like timed entry for instance uh, i was in arches uh, summer before last and they had started a new timed entry program where you log on the night before or in advance and you get a timed entry ticket. And then when you hit the gate, then, then you're in, you're in for the day, you can come and go all day. And um, I talked to the Rangers and they said, it's great. They said, we no longer have fist fights in the parking lot uh, over parking spaces. And there's a certain amount of control over the number of people. So the experience is much better. There's not as much crowding as well. We've also implemented shuttle systems, park outside or within a central area and then get on a shuttle. And the shuttle allows a certain pulsing of the visitors in the park. So uh, permitting all of these kinds of things, I think, and actually, the, believe it or not, the pandemic gave us a chance to um, actually test some of these models, which we hadn't been able to do in the past. And I hope that the Park Service continues to use these and continues to, to refine them and practice with them so that the public gets gets used. I mean, if you go to the movies, you got to buy a ticket, you know, and and if they're all gone, they're all gone. So in the, in the, the same is going to be true with our national parks, I think, in the future. One of the things I would add to that is that, you know, as you, as you acknowledge, John, the, the pandemic provided the Park Service with an opening to try some new things. 
because we were on new territory and and they were more popular. People wanted to get outside. They wanted to connect with something bigger. They wanted to have the ability to to be with their families in a place that they, they felt was safe. Um, we at the foundation have been working with the Park Service for a while now to, to help them think about how to prepare for a future where there are a lot more visitors. John talked about timed entry, uh, the reservation systems. There's, you know, uh, fast pass lanes that entering the entering the new transportation systems. Uh, we're also working with the Park Service right now to develop a single app on their phone that would manage the end to end visitor experience to, to make that more efficient as well, so that you could know well. If I go to this trail, Bridal Veil Falls in, in Yosemite at 11 o'clock in the morning, is it likely to be crowded or not? And to, to be able to have use your digital technology to give you the kind of information that's available for lots of other parts of our lives. Um, we think that'll be really helpful to, to not only manage the visitor within a park, but also help push people out to some of the lesser known parks in these areas because it's not that we want to discourage people from going to Yellowstone and Grand Teton and Glacier mm -hmm. and Yosemite, but there's so many other great places. And if everybody continues to go to these these big places, these very popular parks, they're going to get more impacted. Uh, the resources will be degraded, and uh, the overall visitor experience will be diminished. So we think that you know, even though parks are kind of an analog experience, and that's what we're seeking, the digital technology could be really helpful in making the visitor experience even better. Great. Well, that's a perfect transition to our next question. Uh, how many parks have each of you visited? And uh, more importantly, what are some of the lesser known parks that you would uh, suggest our visitors put on their bucket list? All right, I'll go first this time, John, since the, this, this one is, doesn't require the kind of expertise you have. Um, uh, remember, we talked at the beginning that, that, that we're going to say park sites. We're going to be meant by that. There's 425 park sites. And I think I've been to about 160 in my last count, um, and, and uh, that that is a, a growing list. I've been, you know, more and more of year. I've recently been many times, Jeff, to to Theodore Roosevelt National Park, just thirty miles west of Dickinson, where you went, and uh, that's that's a great spot for all sorts of reasons. I, I would say what lesser known park, um, you know, Voyagers National Park is a place I go up on the Canadian border in northern Minnesota. It's a, a spectacularly beautiful place. I mentioned um, Little Rock Central High School. It's another one of these places that I think is kind of a, a must go to uh, kind of place. And then I think actually Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt is actually a great place. It's, it's, there's a lot of people who drive through it, but to get out into it and go on some of those hikes, incredible wildlife, the, the Badlands are a landscape that you just have to see to appreciate. John? Yeah, um, I'm somewhere around 290, somewhere in that neighborhood. I haven't counted recently, but uh, I think I'm up almost to 300. Um, having worked in Alaska, I had the chance to see most of the Alaska parks, which a lot of people don't get to see. And when I was the regional director, I got out to the far islands of Guam, Saipan, and American Samoa, which is also really hard to get to, particularly National Park of American Samoa. Um, which is worth the trip, by the way. It's a, it's a, it's way out there. Um, in terms of some are lesser known, I mean, it's interesting right here in California, everybody goes to Yosemite, but just a little bit further is Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, and they get about a quarter of the visitation of Yosemite, and they are just extraordinarily beautiful. And even lesser known, and I think also extraordinarily beautiful, is Lassen Volcanic mm -hmm. National Park here in uh, Northern California uh, as well. Um, still love Point Reyes National Seashore, a favorite of both Will and mine. Um, and you can go to Point Reyes on a, on a beautiful, sunny California summer day and, and be able to walk and have a beach to yourself. I mean, it's still doesn't get that much uh, that much use. And then in the in the sort of historical categories, you know, the Civil War battlefields uh, of the, particularly the East, Gettysburg, Manassas, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Wilderness, um, all of those are really, really powerful places, you know, soaked with the blood of our citizens when they when uh, you're in DC and they're like, oh, the nation's never been more divided. I always go, well, 
uh, anybody here remember the Civil War? We were killing each other. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> and then the civil rights sites, I still am a deep believer in using these sites to help us understand uh, the plight of African Americans, uh, of women, uh, of uh, the Hispanic community, Cesar Chavez, others. Um, there, are, there are deep stories there um, that uh, we all need to hear. Thank you. Bruce? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, brothers, we have a couple of questions for you related to Sigma Chi. Big surprise there. Are, at this moment, are there any other Sigma Chi's uh, uh, or in the, in the past that have held leadership roles in the National Park Service? Go ahead, Johnny. You got this one. Okay. So, Stephen Mather, <clears throat> the first director of the National Park Service and basically the, the brains behind the creation of the National Park Service was a Sigma Chi at University of California, Berkeley. And he hosted the very first National Parks Conference and he housed the, all of the attendees in the SIG house on the Berkeley campus. Um, so very, very significant relationship between Sigma Chi and the National Park Service that goes back to the, the very origins. It would have been 1915. Uh, it might be interesting for our audience to know that uh, Brother, Mar Brother Mather also served as the 20th Grand Consul, among other things. Will, do you have any experience with SIGs uh, either in your shop or uh, in your, your travels to the Park Service system? Well, two of my board members, Steve Deming, went to Georgia Tech and Johnny DeStefano, and I can't remember where Johnny went, but uh, both current board members of ours, Sigma Chi. I met Johnny at a Sigma Chi function in D.C. Bruce. He was being honored for his role uh, of working in the White House. Steve is the past chairman of the board of Stanford University and, and the Nature Conservancy. So he's got a real, uh, he's had a very successful life and still actively engaged in it and, and is a major contributor to our organization. Well, would you say that that's just a coincidence or is this actually a, somehow a Sigma Chi thing? What do you think, John? <laughs> well, I think there is uh, some overlap in values between uh, Sigma Chi and, and the Park Service. I mean, uh, Sigma Chi has a deep and storied uh, history um, of service uh, to our brothers, to each other, and to the nation. And, and the National Park Service uh, is focused on providing similar services um, that what we were taught uh, as Sigma Chi is about honesty and truth and devotion and caring for each other uh, are all core values of the Park Service. Um, it is often considered within the Park Service a family um, of, because most people that work for the Park Service um, work for their entire lives for the Park Service. It's a career devotion, a career, and, and can be multiple generations of working for the National Park Service as well. And I think that's that's true in Sigma Chi. My brother, Destry, is a Sigma Chi as well. And uh, he went to William and & Mary and and uh, gave me uh, encouragement to, to consider Sigma Chi as well. So I think there's some connections. We'd like to think so as well. Uh, for both of you, we'll start with, uh, with Will. How would you say that your Sigma Chi experience, both undergraduate and alumnus, has prepared you for your leadership responsibilities uh, in your respective <laughs> areas? Well, I have a bunch of uh, my brothers that are in the chat, so I'm sure <laughs> they, you know, if they could, they'd come on camera, they'll, you know, chuckle or, with, you know, try to hold back a laugh. But uh, uh, I, I somehow landed as the community services uh, director or leader or whatever the, the, t the title was at the time uh, for the chapter. I wasn't as much interested in being a magister or consul in my in my chapter, but I I really resonated with the, the aspect of the work that we did to to reach out to the community, to uh, senior citizen homes. There was a cerebral palsy center in Santa Barbara uh, that we would visit from time to time, and to really channel the energy um, and and you know goodwill of our brothers to to these people who were either lonely or you know really struggling some physical challenge and um that really kind of opened my eyes to, to service in, in a lot of ways and that's really been my whole 
career and to actually have practice at that for those years and then um, you know to to uh, bring an otherwise rowdy and uh, fun bunch to their to their so-called knees to, to to do something calm and in service of others was really a powerful experience and, and uh, I carry that with me through today. Thanks, Will. John, how would you say that your Sigma Chi experience prepared you for the leadership role in the uh, National Park Service? Well, I was going to ask Will. I thought it was just your ability to drink a lot of beer, um, but um, there was a lot of that too, John. Yeah. You? <laughs> <laughs> I think we were both well trained in that in that category. Um, I think my service as McGeester, uh, I was the assistant McGeester for one year and then took on the full responsibility to train the next generation of SIGs. And that's something that I've carried with me uh, into my career in the Park Service is really a lot of emphasis on the next generation and to, to help them attain their mission, their values, their career paths, their goals to serve as a as a mentor um, and as a guide, and to um, and to inspire them uh, to uh, give back um, to their to their country, um, and uh, and to be a good friend uh, to their colleagues and their brothers. So, uh, I, I've carried that I think with me uh, throughout my career, and I continue to do that to this day when I work at UC Berkeley with students there. I spent an hour on the phone last night with an eighth grader. Uh, who was doing a doing his history project uh, on the national parks, and uh, so I think it's continuing to work with that uh, the next generation. Thank you, John. Uh, back to you, Jeff. Sure. Um, how does the system balance the competing objectives of preservation and public access and recreation? I'll take that one again. I guess so. Um, we don't like to call it a balance. Um, interestingly, if anything, we got the thumb on the scale uh, of the balance for preservation. Um, preservation takes priority. And, and we like to, in our policies and our framework, if you've got a decision make to be made, you err on the side of preservation. Because that's really, the if we're not preserving the places, authentically and as naturally as possible, then that diminishes the, the public's experience and their opportunity to, to see it. And so we're different than Disneyland or Six Flags who have to create something in order to provide that experience. Um, we want people to experience our parks in as authentic a manner as possible. And in order to do that, we have to put a priority on preservation. I'd also say, John, that that um, you know the, the visitor doesn't necessarily see that though. You know, when they go to Yellowstone National Park, less than two percent of Yellowstone is so-called developed with roads and buildings and bridges right. and trails, yeah. and so ninety-eight percent of the park is preserved for the wildlife and the the natural system, um, and yet. There's a lot of places for people to go to look at wildlife or to fish or to raft or whatever it might be that they're going to want to do. Um, but John mentioned Point Reyes National Seashore. You go there, and to John's point, you can walk on the beach alone, but there are hundreds of trails you can go on. You, you can you can go fishing. You can dig clams. You can gather berries and things like that that are all part of the experience when you go to Point Reyes. And yet, again, a huge portion of Point Reyes is preserved and, and the priority there is, is the wildlife. And so um, I do think there are also some some places, John, in the system that, that, that uh, you know, national recreation areas uh, might have a, a larger share of the of the resource might be used for outdoor recreation because that was the designation. That was the a primary purpose of it. But still, even in Santa Monica Mountains, a place like that, that uh, where you can and maybe have some more active recreation in the scheme of the total acres that are there, it's still a pretty small portion of it that's used by humans. Yeah. All right, our last question before we uh, open it up to uh, participation by our viewers. Um, there are many SIGs uh, who have a great interest in the parks, the park system. Uh, what kind of volunteer opportunities are there for our alums and, and how can they seek out ways to, to support and engage uh, the park system? 
You want to start with that, Will? For sure. I think that honestly, uh, you know, start with a place that you, you love to go. I know that there's some people on the in the chat here that are from Southern California, and Santa Monica Mountains is is very close by. Joshua Tree, Mojave, uh, all within striking distance from where many people live in the LA basin. Um, and and just go. There are volunteer coordinators and in every national park of any consequence, and and all those places have people there that are their job is about helping you to give back in some way. And it might be, you know, being a docent or an interpreter. Or it could be, you know, just being a, a wayfinder for people to get to the right trail or whatever or whatever it might be. But there are lots of different ways you can give back. In in some cases, they need help doing scientific research, and so there may be an opportunity to. to to support that kind of work. So depending upon the park, the, the, the needs of the time, the, the gap in funding that they might be experiencing at the time, parks will have a, a broad range of jobs, uh, some of which you might have even thought of before that could put you to good work. Yeah, I would strongly agree with Will's comments that Park Service has about somewhere around 300,000 volunteers um, and could not function without them. And there's everything from a one day go in and work on a trail to people that spend their entire summer or, uh, you know, volunteering within an individual park. There's opportunities to give uh, philanthropically, certainly to the National Park Foundation. There are friends groups for parks as well. These are individually focused uh, philanthropic support organizations for individual parks like the Yosemite Conservancy and the like. But I would also encourage um, the SIGs out there to, to spend a little time to get to understand the challenges that the National Park Service faces. Um, that don't, don't take the future of the national parks for granted. There are political forces out there that would sell us off to the highest bidder tomorrow. Um, and uh, without public support, um, you know, the Park Service can either be significantly defunded uh, uh, or significantly undermined in its ability to to meet its mission, to, to preserve these places so that your grandkids and your grandkids' grandkids can experience the Grand Canyon just or, or Teddy Roosevelt or Point Reyes as they as you do today. That's the that's the core mission. And we need the public to support that. And so I think that. Sigma Chi's can, can be a big part of making sure the park's preserved into the future. Jeff, the other thing I was going to say is that, that um, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, graduates and you know, alumni of these places. But there are also opportunities for the students that are currently in college and in, in active Sigma Chi's right now or recently graduated that can get involved in a number of different things. We have uh, the Park Service and the National Park Foundation collectively uh, invest more than $20 million a year in supporting youth service corps. These are teams of 12 or 15 young people who go out of the, into the parks for pay and they work for six to 12 weeks. They go out and build trails, they restore buildings, they eradicate invasive species, they can restore a wetland or a riparian forest. Uh, really interesting work, really consequential and important work of the park, but also something where they can gain new skills and, and in some cases uh, go on to become a leader of a youth corps and learn leadership skills that would benefit them in life, all the while doing something meaningful in the national park uh, that will carry on for generations. So the, 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 we don't have to wait until we're you know as old as John and I are to start getting involved with the parks. These are the kind of things you can do while they're in college or, or recently out of college. Excellent. Well, I think we have a couple of uh, audience questions. Doc Rule. I don't know about Doc Rule. George Cornelius Rule was a career Park Service guy. Started. Uh, he initiate. He pledged at the University of Tulsa in his college years. Didn't initiate. Was initiated at the University of Montana Beta Delta Pro chapter in his thirties and was a uh, was among other things the author of the uh, gla gla sorry guide to glacier national park and the conference center is named after him hmm. he also was the founder of the um i guess you'd call it the 
International Parks Consulting. He, he hmm. started that and spent, he, when he came to Washington and, and lived, he was right behind the chapter house at Epsilon and was a block away from his office in the interior building. Cool. A great sake. Look, Google him, you guys. He's a, a great precursor of the wonderful work you all have done. Yeah, it's starting to, to ring a bell um, now, uh, particularly as it relates to the international programs. So the Park Service, continuing on his legacy, was to serve as a consulting around the world in establishing national park systems. And um, in, in many ways, the National Park Service was helped establish the World Heritage Program because there were many nations that did not have national parks. So World Heritage was a way to do that. And I believe Doc was a big, a big supporter of that, uh, of that development of that program. Bill Blessing uh, looked at a signal that he wanted to ask a question. Bill, are you able to get on uh, get on camera? Perhaps not. Uh, What's our next? Do we have another question from the audience? Here we go, John Darling from John. In addition to the youth core, Will mentioned, are there other opportunities to encourage undergrad chapters to engage and volunteer? educational opportunities absolutely I, th I think that again it's going to be something that's probably within proximity of, of the school they're in probably doesn't make sense for some people to drive you know four hours or go spend a half a day but i just spent a couple of weeks uh teaching a graduate school class in santa barbara and the channel islands national park are right off the shore there and i uh, spent some time with the superintendent of channel islands and they are uh they're in need of a lot of volunteer labor out there, especially of the kind that strong uh, brothers from the Sigma Chi can provide. <laughs> There's a thousand acres of ice plant on the island that needs to be removed uh, as an invasive species. And uh, it doesn't sound, it's, you're out there in an amazing place. You see hundreds of dolphins on the crossing and whales. And so there's a lot of benefits to the trip out there and back and, and very important uh, you know, volunteer work to be had while they're over there that's that's a good example and there's you know hundreds of examples again as i said earlier if, if you check in with the superintendent or his people in each part they'll have a long list of things that i'm sure the brothers can do the other thing to note that in uh, 18 universities colleges and universities across the country the national park service has an employee on campus um, at the Cooperative Ecosystem Study Unit, CESU. You can look that up. And so like here at the University of California, Berkeley, Dr. Ben Becker uh, is the National Park Service employee. He's based on campus. His role is to work with students on internship, volunteer, and research opportunities uh, within the national parks, including helping them find funding. And that would be a great way for university chapters for Sigma Chi to make a connection with those CESU employees to find out about how to make those connections. Because sometimes it's a little bit difficult to sort of make the connection to a park, a specific project or superintendent. But that CESU director can be a liaison for them to make those kind of connections. That could also Thanks. help with alumni. Thanks to, to, to John Darley for that question. And I believe we have one more. This is from Brother Mark Mathias. How can we funnel interested actors looking for post-grad work or research opportunities through you to the right places? John, want to start that one? So it's the same idea. The CESUs, uh, you know, at least at these uh, almost 20 universities, um, are always um, aware of research needs, both natural resource as well as cultural historic um, studies for postdoc work. Um, they're actually there to sort of help the, the, um, the faculty identify research opportunities. So for instance, here at UC Berkeley, Scott Stevens, who's been a, a long-term fire ecologist, has been working with his postdocs in studying the fire ecology of Yosemite National Park. And it's been a long-term study, one in many decades, and we way better understand how to manage fire in these CR ecosystems as a result of that as well. So I would say 
work directly with the CESUs to find those research opportunities. So it's just for the record, uh, Mr. Matthias is the chapter advisor at Zeta Kappa in Santa Barbara. And he also was my roommate as, as a junior and I never knew him to do any research at all. So I'm perplexed by the question. <laughs> Maybe he's starting now. Yeah. Very good. Jeff, I think we have somebody ready to come on camera. Yeah. All right, next question. Yes, hi. I just had to say hello to my friend, Will. And my hi, friend Jeff. Will. How are you, sir? I just wanted to thank both of you gentlemen for your service to this country. Um, I, you know, we rarely get a chance to say that to you in person and, uh, or, or online. Um, but as a, as a new, uh, grandfather, I have a little 18 month old granddaughter. I am so excited to take her to the kinds of places that you are, uh, have made a career of protecting and building and and I'm just uh, so thankful for your work and thankful that I've had a chance to uh, share some of our wild places with Mr. Shafroth for sure um, and a <clears throat> little fishing trip with Mr. Jarvis. Um, but um, uh, I also um, have always admired uh, Will's taste in beer. Um, he's taught me a lot. Um, particularly out in the wilderness. So um, it was all done, you know, appropriately, of course. But, um, you know, he has he has good taste in, in, in that aspect, too. But anyway, all kidding aside, thank you so much for all your work and all your service. Um, we're all the beneficiaries of that. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. And make sure your, uh, your granddaughter becomes a junior ranger. Exactly. Exactly. We have time for another question from our audience. Does anybody else want to go on camera? Going once. John, well, to wrap it up, um, uh, if you had a Harry Potter magic wand and you could just zap yourself to you know one of the parks uh, to spend the rest of the week, where, where would you go? Wow. Well, um, I'd probably go back to Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Reserve in Alaska. Spent uh, five years up there. It's starting to get a little cold right now. Probably uh, you know, dropping below zero. Um, I lived up there, and uh, it's you got it's like the Pleistocene when the glaciers just pulled back. Still got all the big animals that were have been there for thousands of years. It's still got all the native Alaskans still doing their thing that they've been doing for thousands of years. Um, big mountains, big rivers, big glaciers, very small population, um, and a, a really amazing place uh, to see and live. I'd also go back to Alaska to Katmai National uh, Park and Preserve in in. Um, it's more on the western part of, of, of Alaska from compared to where John's talking about. Uh, but it's where the, the, the famous bears go to eat the salmon out of the middle of the air. And fat bear contest, I think, has been held there mm -hmm. the last few years. Uh, but there's it's a very large area, and I've had a chance to fish up there where you get dropped in on a float plane into a remote lake or stream, and you spend eight hours walking uh, in a place and just probably another not another human being for 25 or 30 miles at least and and just feeling the wildness of that place and and kind of the insignificance and smallness of a single human being it really kind of puts uh, a lot of stuff in perspective and to be able to hold a you know a nine pound rainbow trout in your hand that you you caught uh it's pretty powerful too the so. uh, the alaska parks are extraordinary for sure well, well thanks. John, thanks so very much for being with us tonight. Jeff, it's always a pleasure working with you. Great to see you. Uh, even with your sore throat, you know, your your tones came out really well. Jim, kicking it back to you. Okay. Uh, John and Will, uh, thank you so much for enlightening us about the National Park Service and the Foundation. Uh, I think we all know a lot more about it after... Uh, uh, your great delivery tonight, and it's quite evident that uh, the two of you have a dedication and a passion to what you've been doing that, uh, as uh, as uh, the guest who came on a few minutes ago said, uh, a, a great service to our country in what you've been doing. 
Uh, and uh, Jeff and Bruce, thank you very much for doing a great job uh, handling the interview itself. Um, what I'd like to uh, just mention tonight is if anybody who's been paying attention to the business news over the last few days is aware that there's been a terrific rally uh, in the stock market. And one stock in particular, uh, the Home Depot Corporation, has increased in its share price uh, by more than $20 in just the last two days. Uh, and so we've all heard of Home Depot. But what you might not know is that the current chief executive officer of Home Depot, uh, Ted Decker, is also a Sigma Chi. And Ted has agreed to be our um, SIG Talk speaker in January, January 24th to be specific. So you may want to mark that on your calendar. Uh, we'll get promotional material out before that date. Uh, so that, you know, although uh, John and Will are going to be a tough act to follow, uh, we've got a good act to follow them in January. Uh, December, we won't be on. Uh, we go on hiatus for a month uh, and, and try not to compete with all the holiday activities. So once again, thanks to all, uh, as well as our producer director, James Hefner, who uh, brings all the screenshots and, and runs the stream yard so beautifully. So, uh, hey, hey, Jim, we're going to we're going to just if anybody has any questions about this or we'll make sure they know they can plug into www.national.nationalparks.org to get a hold of us. And I know, John, you might want to give a quick commercial message about your work at the you know, at, at Berkeley. Uh, yeah, particularly as it relates to the future of our national parks around climate change. And uh, we have a new Parks Institute at the University of California, Berkeley, sort of building upon the legacy of Stephen Mather and the history of UC Berkeley. So their screening across is, uh, is our website um, at, uh, at UC Berkeley as well. So, so thank you, Jim. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Hef. That was a lot of fun. We'll, we'll see you someplace out in the sticks one of these days. <laughs> well, it was great to have you guys and, and keep up the good work. Thank you. And here it is, 9 o'clock. We're finishing right on time. So good night, everybody. Good. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.